Gentlemen, welcome back to the Not As Good As This Old Tony channel. Cue cheesy guitar riff intro. Ah, oh, fuck that. Buddy Gnu asked me, and I am not above pandering to a single viewer, what Buddy Gnu asked me to do was to go over the CNC machine. There are far better CNC tutorials. You will find better, but you will not find dumber. The three-part series in the first consisting of a concise overview under the petticoats of this here machine. In the second video, we will go over CNC programming via G-code. In the third video, we will go over visual, that is conversational programming, which on the Haas ain't worth, uh, ain't worth the steam off your piss. So maybe we'll omit that one. In the fourth video, we'll go over CAD drawing, and in the fifth, CAM machining. This is a vertical milling machine, three axis. It's a milling machine and it's vertical because the spindle turning is what cuts the metal. In a lathe, the workpiece is turning and the tool is stationary. In a mill, the tool is turning. That is the spindle. It will turn at 15,000 ripples. Here are the three axes, X, this way and that, so X positive, X negative. The Y, forwards and back, forwards is positive, and the Z is on the spindle. You can see the slats there, that moves up and down. The two additional axes are the A axes, which ro ro axis rather, which rotates like this, and the C axis, which rotates around this way. Now, three plus two, axes denotes that these are not simultaneously uh, enabled. In this case, we can go simultaneous in that we have all three axes moving around and simultaneously move the A and the C. While visually impressive, these way covers do nothing for the location or stability of the machine. They are simply slats to keep the big nuggets out from the working bits. We'll go around to the back side of the machine and I will show you the linear axes. I just lower the drawbridge here to get past the control panels. Well, not the control panels, the electrical panels and the mechanical panels. Having a look, we see the Y axis. See precision, not ground, but machine. No, not even precision, machined surfaces. These are not what the axis rides on. These are for the way covers. These are the servo motors, what drive the precision ground. Let's see here, you see in there, that shafting is precision ground and there are ball bearings in that bushing housing. That's what actually pulls the, the, the table to and fro. A servo motor is just, it's a, it's a brushed motor, high power capacity, but the servo entails that it knows its position. And the way it knows its position is with this encoder. So this encoder talks to the confuser, the confuser tells the motor what to do, and the encoder ensures that the motor is doing what the confuser has told it. In the words of the internet's favorite grandfather, Tubal Cain, of particular import when choosing a machine tool, three very important criteria, rigidity, rigidity, rigidity. We see huge cast iron castings, why cast iron and why not fabricated sections or aluminum, because cast iron has uh, inherent damping characteristics that are far superior to just about any other stiff material. This damps, the damping is 50% higher on cast iron that it is on aluminum or steel. That is why in this day and age, we still use huge cast sections when we want rigidity. Also, we see here box ways. These are precision ground ways with bearing slides uh, further in on the cheaper machines, little, you know, the learner machines or the personal CNC, you'll see these as uh, dovetail ways. You also have that on the old bridge ports as well. Dovetail ways are not nearly as rigid as box ways. And that's why we have box ways on this machine. Broad overview of the electrical system. Very likely you will not be into this on account of not wanting to get your fillings melted. Up, up top here, we have some braking resistors. 
This is where the spindle dumps a whole bunch of the spindle motor dumps a whole bunch of current in order to get it stopped quick, fast, in a hurry. We see the main disconnect, the main power disconnect here, which feeds into the variable frequency drive. This is what runs the spindle. Uh, down here we have some just some some voltage um, transformers for the control circuitry. I don't believe it's for the vector drive. The vector drive takes power rectifies it, it takes AC power, rectifies it into DC power, stores it on some capacitors on what they call the DC bus, then it chops it up with, with MOSFETs, or in this case IGBTs, uh, insulated gate bipolar transistors, chops it up to get the correct speed of that spindle motor. Here's some control circuitry, there's just a board back there, nothing serious. These are the drives themselves for each of the servos. And we see they're encased in a zinc uh, platen. They're just boards on there. And here's another control board just telling these guys when to chooch and when not to. If and you ever had an electrical problem and you were qualified and wanted to have a look in the cabinet, you need to be mindful of electrostatic discharge, the static electricity, but this whole unit is grounded. So if you just touch a bare metal part, you will not, you will dissipate all your static electricity. There we see the board, a um, whole bunch of MOSFETs on the input and output, some opto isolators, big resistor there, some, uh, some DC relays, clickety clacking away, some built in relays on the board. Essentially, the only thing you're going to be able to do on that board is look for shit stains. Here at the starboard stern, we're into the mechanical cabinet. This is for lubrication as well as all the air implements a lot of the movements that need to be done very quickly for instance the tool change is done with air so we have all the solenoids controlling the air here's the main air supply valve we turn that on and the brake booster goes right quick fast in a hurry this is an ancillary unit so it's additional equipment this brake booster is a pressure increaser. It's a pressure intensifier, essentially a, a differential piston there, increases the pressure of the air and that gets sent only to the rotary axis. It's a brake booster. So it gets the brake on the rotary axis gets more pressure so that it breaks harder. Still on the starboard, but more to the bow, we have the minimum quantity lubrication. This is Haas branded canola oil. It gets mixed with air and atomized at the cutter head in order to uh, prevent chip welding. I'll have you know, canola oil, rapeseed, goes rancid and it also is flammable. So minimum quantity lubrication is an option. It's good for filming because you don't see big, great big gobs of uh, stringy white coolant flying everywhere, but I have, haven't used it because it doesn't seem as effective as running the, the proper coolant. This is an option, minimum quantity lubrication. All of these options are things that if you had the time and the inclination, you could very easily make them. You know, when you're sharing the machine with the bank anyway, you might as well let the bank pay for things a dollar down and a dollar a week type deal. Back into the machining cavity, we have auxiliary air coming from over in the cabinet. We can use that with an M code. We can program that to do things, uh, special things on the table here. Like um, you can have special vices that, uh, or, or vacuum clamping. We can see on the rotary axis, here's the brake line, high pressure line. One thing I did not like was all these uh, high cost Belden cables, which are branded Haas. They were flopping in the breeze and whacking on the way covers. So I've just added some of that uh, high, that nylon spaghetti for hydraulic lines. Speaking of cool, here are the coolant jets. What spray lubricating coolant all over the coolant. Uh, it looks milky white. You can get different varietals, but this is, it's essentially soap. It's soap in water and you can adjust these nozzles where you need them. There's also a, a motorized one and you program the tool length into this thing and it knows the tool length and then you program where you want that nozzle head and every time you pull up that tool it will 
point the nozzle head where it needs to be. Now, this is the minimum quantity lubrication here. When we enable that, this shoots out, this is on a cylinder, it shoots out and sprays just a fine aerated mist of oil on your part. Sternly looking onward now, we see the coolant tank. This is a movable tank, so you can clean it out. Coolant and some small chips come down in a cascade back into the sump. We have a low pressure and a high pressure uh, coolant pump. This has the option of through spindle coolant. Coolant can go through the spindle and through the tool if you want, or it can go through those jets or none at all. When the coolant pump is energized, there is fluid continually cycling through the sump. The fluid does go bad after a time. Water evaporates out of it. It changes the concentration, so you had to have, uh, add water. It's very critical to get the correct ratios. That way your, your machine doesn't rust away to nothing. Also, as with everything, there are little critters what eat this stuff and eventually it goes rancid. It also picks up, of course, tramp oil off of the parts and just lubing down the ways and so forth. So there'll be a skiff of, of scamp, uh, tramp oil on there rather that you can pick up either with a skimmer for a couple hundred bucks, it's an option, or you just take a, a oil absorbing tampon and let it float in there and it sucks up all the oil. At the top of the machine, we see the tool carousel. This is a 50 hole carousel, all the tooling in there. This is CAT 40 tooling and it goes into the spindle automatically. When a tool change is commanded, the tool holder and tool comes down through the ceiling into the double arm. The double arm is a pneumatic actuated tool changer. It pops down on a cylinder, twists, grab the tool, and at the same time, there's two there's two ends here. At the same time, it grabs the tool out of the spindle after the spindle has been oriented by the software, grabs the tool and exchanges it very rapidly for a new tool. Oft neglected, but muy importante, you don't shit, you die, is the chip collection mechanism. This is a flighting, an open flighting, and it rotates and pushes chips up and out. In stool-like fashion, the chips emerge and get pushed in pulses as that flighting rotates into a chip bin. All the chips get recycled or thrown right in the pocket bucket. There's a control panel, very intimidating looking, but there's a button just about for everything and you don't need, buttons are good because they help you not have to scroll through different um, stages. The, the more scrolling that you need to do, the more that you need to keep in your mind, which is difficult cognitively. So the more buttons, the better. I know it looks intimidating and also we have a secondary control. This is called the pendant. There is a Hall effect sensor in here which senses a, a magnet and it takes control away, some of the control away from the main panel when you have this activated. Essentially what you use it for is hand jogging, so moving things by hand and also just stopping and starting to test programs. We're into the boot sequence and it is flashing red. That means we have an error. I turned on the compressor. This is an air hog and we hit reset. I have a little button here, what is supposed to blow air onto the view screen so you can see what's going on. It doesn't work worth a shit, but it is a selling feature. Also, when the spindle is turning above a set value, in this case it's 750 ripums, there is a solenoid, air solenoid, what uh, locks the door. So you cannot open the doors while the machine is running. However, you can open these pseudo gullwing things. Ah! And then you can get right in there and take your high speed shots and so forth. So this is our handle jog. This is our main input for moving the thing around, jogging, jogging it around. We hit handle jog. It tells us the axis A and C aren't zeroed. So we'll close the doors and then we'll hit zero return all. I see every axis is home by the little pictograph of a cute little house, except for Z, for some reason. Now we go to, as I said, we go to handle jog, and then we select the axis we want to jog, in this case, Z. Now, this hand jog is positive in the clockwise direction and negative in the anti-clockwise direction. 
It's good to think about, before you put your hand on the jog wheel, it's good to think about which direction you're actually gonna move. I'm gonna go down on the Z, which is the negative direction. That means anti-clockwise on the wheel. Now we go up. Now we change axis to the X. And we go anti-clockwise to go negative, clockwise to go positive. Then if we hit shift and the AC button, we get the last axis we used, which is C, that's the small one, and we will rotate that vise. Now we hit the shift A again, the brake released, you heard that little psh of air, and we're gonna move the A axis. We'll do a tool change, we go into MTDI, and we put what tool we want, we want tool 051, which happens to be the Renishaw probe, and then we hit ATC, reverse or forward, We are ready to put the dick in the vise. She's all set and raring to go get probing on some parts and actually make some stuff. In the next video, we will go over G-code and probing parts, work offsets and tool offsets with the Renishaw probe doing simple G-code. So thanks for watching. If you got any resources you'd like to tell other people about uh, in regards to these type of videos, CNC, Go ahead and put them in the doobly-doo. I am well aware, as I said, that uh, John Saunders over at CN NYCNC does great videos as well. Uh, I gotten some good info out of that, uh, the titans of CNC fella. There's also, uh, well, there's lots of stuff online. It takes a bunch of different resources to kind of pick and choose the style you want to learn at. YouTube's good for that. Spanks for watching. See you next time. Keep your dick in a vice.